we're beginning a new series. Um, Michael and I have been thinking and praying and thinking about the church where we're at the moment, and not just ourselves, but you know the, the context in which we find ourselves, um, where we live in a world that is absolutely in chaos at the moment. Uh, you know, whether it's riots in London and or protests, or whether it's COVID nineteen, um, we've had Brexit and uh, just a raft of chaos just hitting the, the, the nation one after another. And we, we look forward, don't we, to what is sure to be, uh, apparently, the worst economic crisis that this country would have faced since the war. That's what they're predicting in light of COVID-19. And so, you know, there's a lot of uncertainty. Everything, it seems, is uncertain. And at such a time as this, the, 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 the right thing, the only thing that makes sense to do when you know God is to call upon him. Because ultimately, he is our rock. He is the wisdom of Jesus is the wisdom of God. He knows the end from the beginning. He knows how to take care of us. And we, we can be confident as believers that though this world is being shaken, we stand on a rock. That we can live for in this crisis time with a confidence that should baffle people. But you know, we must pray. It's really important. So we're going to be doing a series on prayer. We, we need it for us as a church because we have all sorts of uncertainties ahead of us at New Life. And I'm sure that's true for you folks at Storrington. There are all sorts of uncertainties about the future. And so it's really important that we pray. Now, we are doing a series on prayer, but today we're going to focus on prayer a little bit, but mainly we'll be thinking about um, the relevance of being the, a ho the household of believers and prayer. Okay, We'll be thinking about the relevance um, of being the household of believers. We'll come to that in a moment. But before we do that, I just want to emphasise the importance of prayer, okay, and, and, and the unique opportunity and privilege that we, the church, have when it comes to prayer. In the book of Joel, in chapter 2, he prophesies a time when all God's people will prophesy, okay, and it's an interesting passage of scripture that's quoted in Acts chapter 2. It, we read in Acts chapter 2, this is that the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God has been poured out on the church, on the, on the, on the early church, okay? 125 believers. Spirit of God is poured out upon them. And the Bible says they all speak in tongues. And there was a crowd of unbelievers looking on. And, and as these people were speaking these languages, they'd never spoken before. They hadn't learned this lang these languages. The onlookers could hear them speaking in their own language. Okay, so it's like this is a miracle. These people are they're speaking in languages they've not even learned. And as they saw that, as they witnessed that, people began to mock the church. They thought it was just weird craziness. And Peter says this. He says they're accused, by the way, of being drunk as well. This is what Peter says. These people are not drunk as you suppose it's only nine in the morning no this is what the prophet joel spoke quote from the prophet joel in the last days god says i will pour out my spirit on all people your sons and daughters will prophesy your young men will see visions your old men will dream dreams even on my servants both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy. Now, I just want to know, it says, in those days, I will pour out my spirit on all people, it says, your sons and daughters, your old men and young men, even on servants, in other words, everyone, both men and women. Now, you might think, what's this got to do 
with prayer, if we're thinking about prayer. Well, just it's worth noting that throughout the rest of the New Testament, tongues, which is a gift, a New Testament gift, a gift of the Holy Spirit, is never really referred to as prophecy. In fact, it's contrasted with prophecy in 1 Corinthians chapter 14. And yet, it falls under the umbrella, it seems, of prophecy here. What Joel prophesied, this speaking to God in different languages, comes under the broad umbrella of prophecy, as do visions and dreams. Now, here's the point, okay, that's being made here. In the Old Testament, prophets were a very, very privileged group of people. They were, you know, there weren't that many prophets. You know, if you got to meet a prophet, it's like, whoa, he's a prophet. Wow, you know, awesome, you know, to meet a prophet. And when a prophet spoke, the whole nation should have, they didn't always, but they should listen. Why? Because he would speak God's words. Now, here's the thing about the prophet, okay, in the Old Testament. The prophet, what made him unique was he was one who stood in the very presence of God and heard words from God and could commune with God in a way that the vast majority knew nothing about. And he would then bring God's word to the people. Well, the spirit that is poured out on all believers in the New Testament is the spirit of prophecy or is a prophetic spirit. Put it how you want. In other words, all God's people will have the kind of access to God that only the prophets in the Old Testament ever had. You know, like I said, if you, 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 most people weren't prophets. And they'd have looked at the prophets and thought, wow, must be awesome. They must have wondered, what's it like to be able to actually engage with God, the God of the universe? Absolutely staggering privilege that they would have. But this is what's promised to all believers. Brothers and sisters, if you are a believer, you probably, like me, just don't appreciate this great, great privilege that is ours. The honour of it. And if you're not a believer yet, if you've not yet come to know the Lord Jesus, if he's not broken into your life and changed you forever, one of the things you're missing out on is access to God. This is, this is so radical. This is beyond any kind of gift that God could, yeah, any other gift that he could give us, because this is access, connection to God himself. And so, now prayer is what we do with that access. We might prophesy and God might give us gifts and all sorts of other things, but but we all can pray. Paul speaks about praying in the spirit on all times. It's that same prophetic spirit that grants us access to God. And you know what? You know, prayer is important because right from the beginning of the Bible, all the way through, at every level, prayer marks two things. Now, you can marks all sorts of things, I guess, but two things that I want to draw our attention to it marks the beginning of faith okay now i'm not saying it marks the beginning of god's work in us that yeah god could be at work in a person long before they ever pray but prayer is the is a, is a mark of faith and, and secondly it often marks a turning point so in other words you know god's people they may have been in sin but God brings them to repentance, and what do they do? They turn and begin again to pray. Okay, now, right, the way, right at the very beginning of the Bible, God made Adam and Eve there in the garden, and they would have to do the equivalent of praying every day with God. God would come and meet with them in the garden. They would speak with them. That's what prayer is all about, speaking with God. But they sinned. And by chapter three, they're kicked out of the Garden of Eden. And that's God's way of saying, you're, you're cut off from me. And they didn't have the same relationship with God after that. They did have a relationship, but it wasn't the same. And then, then by chapter four, godlessness 
prevails. So they, they, people have, are so disconnected from God. You got the first murder. Cain, uh, God's son, Cain, so not God's son, Adam's son, Cain, murders Adam's second son, Abel. First murder, his blood spilled. And Abel was a righteous man, we're told. But do you know what we find? By the end of chapter four, Abel's been killed. Many years have passed. Eve falls pregnant with another son. It says to replace Abel. In other words, he's going to be another good and a righteous son. And, and it, just as it's when it seems that evil is going to overtake the world, Seth comes, a righteous man. But we read, yeah, that that that, be, that marks uh, hope. But you know, we read. Let me read it to you. For, Chapter four, this is the last um, few verses, chapter four. Adam knew his wife, that means made love to her, and she gave birth to a son and named him Seth, saying, God has granted me another child in place of Abel. He says, he's going to be an, a, a, a righteous child. And he named Seth, and it says this, Seth, that's the son, also had a son and named him Enosh. At that time, people began to call on the name of the Lord. In other words, there was a turning point where people who hadn't been before began to call on the name of the Lord. That's prayer. And so we see right from the beginning, it's the first thing that kind of marks out people the people of god they're people who the people of god are people who call on the name of the lord now we could trace this theme of prayer right the way through the bible but we, we just don't have the time and it's certainly not the main point that i want to be making but what we also find in the New Testament, well, in the Old Testament, we find people like King David prayed and everyone else, but every, you know, prayer is a major thing. Um, but then we find in the New Testament that the, the New Testament believers are constantly praying. So again, even before the Holy Spirit comes, this is what we read. Then the apostles returned to Jerusalem from the hill called the Mount of Olives, a Sabbath day walk from the city. When they arrived, they went upstairs to the room where they were staying. Those present were Peter, John, James, Andrew, Philip, it lists the disciples. In those days, Peter stood up among the believers, a group numbering about 120. Okay, so now there's 120 believers all gathering in this upper room. And it's in this upper room before the spirits come that they replace Judas Iscariot, okay? And then when we read on a little bit further, this same gathering, it says, but chapter two, when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of the violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. This is the coming of the Holy Spirit. It's actually not the verse I was looking for. Um, oh, verse four, chapter 1, verse 14. This is when they're in the upper room. It says... They all joined together constantly in prayer. So you've got the 120 before the spirits come. They're joined together constantly in prayer. And it's in that context that the spirit of God comes in a remarkable way. Now, it's true. The Holy Spirit has only ever come once in that way. OK, that was a unique work of God. OK. But that doesn't mean that it's the only time the Spirit has come upon his people. The Spirit comes upon his people multiple times throughout the New Testament, throughout the book of Acts. And we see the Spirit come upon Peter when he preaches his first sermon. We see in Acts chapter 4, when the disciples are being persecuted, 
the Holy Spirit comes upon God's people when they're all praying in Acts chapter 4. It says they're all filled with the Spirit and filled and, and proclaim the word of God boldness. And we find this, this spirit of prayer prevailing at, always at crisis points. The church in prayer. Okay? And then even Jesus, after, you know, in his earthly ministry, he prayed. We know that. Do you know what the Bible tells us right now about Jesus? It says this in Hebrews, he ever lives to intercede for us. He ever lives to intercede. In other words, Jesus, what's he doing in heaven? You ever wondered? He's praying. Ever lives to intercede. So Jesus right now is praying. He's praying for the church. He's praying for us. In the, when you go to the book of Revelation, you see, you get a kind of a glimpse of the saints in heaven. Those that have been martyred. And what are they doing? It says they're crying out to the Lord. How long, O oh Lord? How long? They're, they're, they're calling out to God to bring judgment on the earth and on those that martyred them. They're praying. So prayer it, it's, 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 it's the most basic, essential, fundamental aspect, really, of what it means to be a Christian. It means to be someone who calls on the Lord, who trusts in the Lord, who depends on the Lord. So that's the kind of survey over to underline the importance of prayer. But, you know, um, you know and prayer is about our relationship with God, right? Now, here's where where I want us to think about because the Bible teaches that the church is the body of Christ in other words there's a oneness about us Jesus is the head that's what the Bible says 1 Corinthians chapter 13 it's just an it's an image to speak of how we're dependent on God on Jesus as our leader as it were and how we are one okay and the Bible uses various other metaphors as well. It speaks about the church as the household of believers. And it says some really important things about that as well. So if I'll just look up a verse, this is from Isaiah 56. Isaiah 56. Listen to what it says. Actually, I'll read from verse 6. And foreigners who bind themselves to the Lord, in other words, it's not just Jews, but anyone who bind themselves to the Lord to minister to him, to love the name of the Lord and to be his servants, all who keep the Sabbath without desecrating it and who hold fast to my covenant. These I will bring to my holy mountain and give them joy in my house of prayer. He's speaking about the temple there. The temple is his house of prayer prayer their burnt offerings and sacrifices will be accepted on my altar for my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations god's house is a house of prayer we in the new testament are that house we're god's household each local church is a household of believers with god he's our father right now, this is a really important image. New Life Church, we are a household of believers and God is our father. Storrington Chapel, you are a household of believers. God is your father. He's the father of your household, just like he's the father of New Life Church household. And each household is to be, a God's household is a house of prayer. Now, this is really important to get because do you remember what Jesus did when he visited the temple of the Jews? At that time, the temple was meant to be the house of prayer. But what did he say? You've turned it into a den of thieves. And he turned over the tables of the money changers. He made whips and started driving people out. He got really hardcore. Why? It wasn't just that they'd made it into a den of thieves. Do you know what? It's that they made it into something that it shouldn't have been. And we may not make God's household into a den of thieves, hopefully not that. But is it a household of prayer? 
because prayer is how we define our relationship with God. Like I said, all of us, we're individuals. And if you're a believer, you have this great privilege that I mentioned earlier of being able to pray to God, right? In other words, you have a relationship with him. But what's true for us as individuals is true for the church, the household. The church has a relationship with God as a church. So when we gather together as a church, as one body, we sing his praises, don't we? That's kind of prayer. It's an aspect of praying. We do it as a household of believers. And, you know, we do that in New Life Church. We do it, you guys at Storrington Chapel, you do that. You relate to God as a church. Now, you know, I've got four daughters, beautiful daughters, love them all, all grown up. And, um, and not that long ago was Father's Day, wasn't it? Was it, was it last week? It was, wasn't it? Last, Saturday, last Sunday, yeah. And, yeah, it was great because, do you know what my daughters did, okay? They all bought me gifts, which was really nice. I was a little bit puzzled because they all brought me the same gifts, beer, okay? They all bought me, like, little tinnies or whatever, cans of beer. And that was really nice, you know. And what was happening there is, and they gathered, it was like, I was the, I'm the father of my family, of my household. And they gathered and gave me gifts. That's kind of what happens when we gather as a church. We gather to give God gifts. And, you know, it was a beautiful time with my daughters because they expressed in the giving of their gifts, not just giving gifts, but they gave you know, love and affection. And it was a really beautiful time with my family. I really enjoyed it. And I trust that many of us know that experience, what it's like to have your family with you. And when, on a special day, if it's your birthday or anything, when they express love. But they didn't just give me beers, okay? They did do that, and that was great. But, they, but I guess they'd scratched their heads and thought, we'd like to do something more for Dad but we can't afford it ourselves. Maybe we can club together. And they all clubbed together and got me a really nice fridge to put my beers in. <laughs> That's what they got. And uh, now they couldn't have it. None of them would have been able to do that on their own. But together, they brought me an, an offering. And it was the best that they could manage. Yeah. And, and, and so that's a great picture because God is the father of the household of the church. And like every Sunday, at least, it's kind of like Father's Day. And the question is, what sort of offering do we bring to God? You know, when you come to singing, do you sing your best? You know, do you, when, when you pray to God, do you give, bring in the best words of praise that you can muster up, that your limited vocab, we all have a limited vocab, that your limited vocab can bring? Do you bring the very best that you can? When you're, when you're expressing love, do you, do you, is it genuine? When we're singing those songs, is it the expression of hearts full and bursting with love of, and praise for the Lord? And we express it through those songs. Is that what it is? Or, you see, there's a danger that the kind of household, of, the kind of relationship we have with the Lord as a church is more like the sort of family that says, oh, I can't really be bothered to see him on Father's Day, but I suppose I have to. Yeah, I'll have to show my face. Then I can go and do what I want to do. You know? We, we, can have, we could have that kind of attitude. Oh, do I have to spend all day with him? With the family of believers? We, we can have that kind of attitude, right? We can have the sort of attitude. Like, imagine my daughters. They were like, oh, we can't, you know, we can't really afford to buy them a fridge. But together we could. And everyone puts in as much as they could. But one of them's like, oh, I don't, I don't want to give much money to that. I want to keep as much for myself. I, I, I can give a fiver. He won't, I won't even notice that. I'll just give a fiver. I won't notice that. Go on. Get, and one of, imagine one of them just gives the minimum, right? Like for all the others, it's like the thing is, even though others gave their best, the offering of the church is not what it could be, is it? It's less because everyone didn't give God their best. Uh, 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 just like any family relationship, the relationship between the father and his children can be a close one or a distant one. 
It can be full of affection or cold. When the Lord looks at New Life Church and sees our gatherings, sees us worshipping and singing, looks at all of us, when he does that at Storrington Chapel, what do you think he thinks of the offering, of the words of praise? I'm always pulled up short by Judas Iscariot because when he betrayed Jesus, he betrayed him with a kiss. Do you know, in Greek language, the word for worship is a word called proskynios. And that's made up of two words, pros, which means towards, and kinios, which means to kiss. To worship, it's kind of like to kiss towards God or to God. And so you can think of it like this. It's about expressing our love and affection to him. And Judas took that expression, took that symbol, a kiss, and it wasn't true. He betrayed Jesus. His kiss was a lie, wasn't it? It wasn't full of love and adoration. Behind that kiss was nothing like worship. And again, there's a danger that we can, we can sing the songs, we can pray the prayers, but what's behind it? That's the question. Would Jesus say of us, when he quoted Isaiah, what he said of the people in his day, with their lips they honour me, but their hearts are far from me. You see, our, 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 this relationship that's been opened up to us at first at Pentecost and ever since by the Lord Jesus is a relationship of love between us and him. And, and, and here's a, 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 there are two aspects to this that I want to draw out from this metaphor of the household of believers, okay? What kind of family are we? Two dimensions, okay? The first is our relationships with one another in the local church. God wants us to be a family that really loves each other. That's the kind of family God wants us to be. That's why Jesus said, by this will all men know that you're my disciples, by the love you have one for another. He wants us to really, really love one another. Okay? 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 8, this came up in our last series. Above all, above all, okay, whatever else you do, well, above all of that, the, the, the most important thing is love each other deeply from the heart. He's like saying, church, look, you, you, we're all, we all fail. We fail in all sorts of ways. But the one thing, don't fail in this. Don't fail to love one another. Let that be the one thing. You know, if you fail at anything, fail at anything else. But don't fail at this. Love one another deeply from the heart. That's a challenge, isn't it? A new command I give you, Jesus says, love one another as I have loved you, so you are to love one another. Now just think about that, the standard of love that he's calling the church to. Or, you know, everyone in New Life Church, every, if you're a part of New Life Church, Jesus says you're to love your brothers and sisters in the church in the way that Jesus loved us. At Storrington Chapel, you are to love one another with that magnitude of love. Huge. And the thing is, this is what makes the church shine. It's, it's, it's not, you know, I wasn't going to say it's not our message. It is our message. But the, the, the reason why it's our message is because our message is a message of radical love. The love of God for the lost souls, to redeem them. Express them through the love of God's people to one another. And so, you know, this love is the thing. It's a message of love that is meant to be displayed in the church. So again, I want to ask this question. When God looks at New Life Church, what do you think he sees? Does he see a company of people that really love one another? Now, again, 
Uh, and the same question for you guys at Storrington, is that what he sees? Not people that just tolerate one another, just put up with one another. It's good that we do that. Sometimes we have to do that, don't we? Because, you know, we might get a little bit grumpy or whatever. But as a rule, it's, that, that's not our settling point. Not people that just give to one another the minimum that we can get away with, but the maximum. Again, using the illustration of my own family, and perhaps you could use your own family, think about your own family. But, you know, when my, one of the joyful things, one of the things that brings every parent great joy is to see their children really loving one another. Yeah, it's a great tragedy when there's a split in the family. Terrible thing. Or if, the, you know, it, 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 like I said, I've got four doors. If they are always bickering about one another, you know, backbiting, backstabbing, that would be a terrible thing. Or if they, they, you know, I love to hear about it. You know, they've got a, we have a family WhatsApp, but they've got a, like a sister's one. Me and George, we're not invited into that. They've got their own sister's one. They love each other. They absolutely, they do. And it shows, you know, when they're together, they love getting together. Okay, Gemma's here. She knows it's true. The great joy, the great joy for all of us is, is being together. And for me, seeing how my daughters all really, really love and really care for one another, get, keeping in touch, they all know how each other are doing. They know, because they find out. They're interested in one another. It's a joy for me as a father to see that in my daughter. God gives us families because he wants us to know what it's like for him to have his family. And he wants us, you know, just as my daughters love one another, it, here's the thing, right? New life, Storrington, we're God's family. And when he looks at us, this, these brothers and sisters, he wants to see brothers and sisters, again, that really do love one another. No less than my daughters love one another. Not less than that. There's a fallacy, um, or it's a lie that I've heard so many times, is that there's a, there's a kind of a kernel of truth in it, as often is the case. But I've often heard people say, you know, that there's a priority when it comes to God. God first, family second, church third, and everything else fourth, right? I don't know if you ever heard that. But, do you know, when we say that, we, we just, we're just missing the point, completely missing the point. It's true that when my children were young and grown up, they were my responsibility to care for because they've got to be cared for. It wasn't someone else's responsibility to do it. That was mine and George's. We were the parents. But the Bible doesn't suggest in any way that we, that we should love other children less than our own. That's a radical thing, isn't it? The Bible doesn't give that impression at all. Love one another deeply from the heart. We don't love... It's, it's, not that, it's not that my family was, was ever more important than anyone else's family or than the church family. It's not. When it's more important to me, here's kind of what I'm saying. I'm saying, you know, these are the ones that I love more than anyone else. Therefore, and I care for them and I want what's best for them. Therefore, they're more important to me than anyone else. Okay, here's what that forgets. The church is God's family, and he cares for the church more than I care for my daughters. And he wants his church loved and taken care of by the brothers and sisters. Not less. Not, he, doesn't want, he doesn't want the church brothers and sisters to love one another less than my own daughters love one another. Do you see the point? And so God wants his the, uh, you know, brothers and sisters to, to love to be together. You know? My daughters again, if they get, whenever they get a chance, they, 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 they'll overcome and prioritise to get together again. It gets harder, doesn't it, as you get older, but they make every effort to be together. And the church should be like that. That's the first aspect. God wants us, wants the church to love one another, the brothers and sisters. Second, God wants us as a family to love him. I'm going to carry on using this metaphor, 
on Father's Day. You know, it was a bit of a shame because COVID-19, I couldn't hug my children. I haven't yet hugged them for ages. And, uh, it, and it's a beautiful thing, isn't it, to be able to do that? And to express love. We've already sort of gone over this to some degree, so I'm not going to repeat the things I was saying a few minutes ago. But let me say this. It's not hard to tell for me that my children really love me. And I reckon that anyone who was to visit our family and see, they would work out very quickly that Julian's children, they really love their dad. They really love their mum. It's easy to tell. And I think that's a good acid test for us as churches. Is it obvious that, your ch that you as a church really love your father in heaven? Is that obvious from the way that you praise him, the way that you sing to him, the way that you pray, the way that you give your attention to his word, the way that you appreciate and love to hear from him, the way that you talk about him? Is it obvious that you love your heavenly father? It says, this is from Psalm 66. We read this, I think, last week. Shout for joy to God, all the earth. Sing the glory of his name. Make his praise glorious. There's a command. His praise should be glorious. Sometimes, I, yeah, it, it, is it glorious? You know, I... I remember a friend of mine called John Gillespie. He said, so often he looks at a congregation, he says, and they've got no faces. He said, in other words, they've got no written all over their face. Let's sing for joy to the Lord. What's written on the faces? No. You know, some, some of us as believers, we, I'm sure that, that maybe we think I'm a bit too cool for kind of really singing and praising God. I'm too cool. Uh, yeah, I, I, I couldn't be that undignified. David was, King David. You know, none, none of us are above giving God the very best that he deserves. None of us. We shouldn't have that kind of pride. Let's not have no faces. You know, when the moment comes to sing his praise, to pray out, we should all just be biting at the bit. Every single one of us, not a single exception. And if you're an exception, you know, oh, there's all sorts of reasons why we don't give God praise and glory. But it's usually pride. It usually comes down to that. That or one other. And that, if that's the case, then we need to repent. That's what we do as Christians. We don't continue in it. We repent and give him our best because he deserves it and nothing less. But here, there's, there's another reason why. Sometimes I think we don't glorify God when we get, I'm talking about when we gather as a church, because all of this, this is about the context of prayer, right? We're going to be coming to prayer in the future weeks. But when we gather as a church, I think sometimes we don't give God that kind of praise. Here's the reason why, because it's not in us. It's just not in us. If we're oft, so often, if we're honest, we don't really, we're not really that, you know, enamoured by God. There's no affection. It's just not there. And so we, we'll, we'll kind of sit, hang back. Maybe others are singing while we just have a little chit chat. Got more, you know, more interest, something more interesting to talk about than focusing on the, the God of heaven. It's mad. Absolutely, absolutely mad that, that anyone would be chit-chatting while we're worshipping God. What kind of madness is that? So I think sometimes it's because it's just not in us. Now, as we close, here's the good news, okay? The really good news is this. You know, I know, I know that New Life Church, and I know it's true for you at Storrington Chapel, we lack certain resources, okay, that you might find if you go to these big city churches. Okay, there's all sorts of things we may or may not have, right? All sorts of challenges we might face. But here's something that we cannot be denied. 
we cannot be denied the ability to be white hot worshippers of God. Nothing can stop us. The only re if we're not white hot worshippers of God, the only reason is because we don't really want to be. There's no other reason. Because God wants us to be like that. We don't need any razzmatazz and brilliant musicians and technology and flash buildings and millions of people, whatever. We don't need any of that, you know? Doesn't matter how small a group we are. Doesn't matter how well we sing or what our instruments we've got and how good we are and all that, how great the preach is. None of that, you know, none of that is necessary for us to be white hot worshippers of God that are ablaze with fire and passion for him. There's no reason why we can't do that. I, 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 I hear the kind of the, the retort to that, the reply, oh yeah, but there's sin and all those things. Yeah, but we can repent. We can. <laughs> Sunday morning, we can get up out of our seat and say, I'm leaving my sin behind, Lord. I'm, 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 do, I'm done with it and I'm going to glorify you because you're worthy. And so over these next weeks, we're going to be thinking about how, how, you know, how do we be the kind of church, a praying church, that God wants us to be, a white hot church. Well, it begins with prayer. Begins with prayer. And, and the last thing that I want to say is, is an assurance, okay? I think that sometimes, as a, if you're a believer, we sometimes think that, I don't want to get too serious about God because I want to enjoy my, enjoy my life. I want a lot of my life myself because I just want to enjoy it. And I don't want to have to be serving or doing this or do it, whatever. We can have that kind of thinking. And do you know, I, I, I get that. I understand that. But the call to love God more, to glorify him more, is not a call to love other people less or to enjoy the good things that he gives any less. We're not saying don't enjoy the good things that God's given. But we are saying don't, they're not greater than the God of heaven. Here's the thing. We're not even saying sacrifice all those things. Unless they're sinful and they're a distraction from your faith. But we're not saying sacrifice those things. What we're saying is if you're excited about those things. And if that's what you're most excited about and what you enjoy most, it's because you haven't discovered just how amazing God is. What we want is for you to discover him and his greatness. And you know what? One of two things will happen. You'll either, you know, everything else pales in significance compared to him, right? So one of two things happens. Either you're, you won't be bothered about those things anymore because just God's the bees, bees knees, the cat's pajamas. He is everything. Or you'll enjoy those things even more and be thankful to God for them and glorify him. So it's a win-win. That's not to say there are not sacrifices to be made. We must turn our backs on sin and repent. And there are good things that Satan would offer us to rob us of the best. You don't want to be deceived. But the Bible tells us that God gives us all things for our enjoyment. So he's not saying, you know, we can't have anything, enjoy anything. But just that if they're the best things that we've got, we are being robbed. Jesus said, the thief comes to steal, kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Let's close. Let's pray.